The philosopher Galen Strawson argues that moral responsibility is impossible. By this he means that any and every attempt to morally blame somebody or to give them credit is a mistake. To defend this thesis that moral responsibility is impossible, Galen Strawson presents what he calls the basic argument. He writes, quote, There is an argument, which I will call the basic argument, which appears to prove that we cannot be truly or ultimately morally responsible for our actions. According to the basic argument, it makes no difference whether determinism is true or false. We cannot be truly or ultimately morally responsible for our actions in either case. End quote. That argument goes as follows. First, nothing can be the cause of itself. Nothing can bring itself into existence. Second, moral responsibility requires that something can be the cause of itself. For Strassen, this will require that we are the cause of the type of person we are in a special way. Without this special kind of self-causation, we cannot be morally responsible for our actions. Well, since something that is required for us to be responsible for our actions doesn't exist, we can never be truly morally responsible for anything we do. The first premise, the one that says that nothing can be the cause of itself, that seems certainly true. Galen Strawson allows for the possibility that God could be the cause of himself, but that has nothing to do with what we're interested in here, the moral responsibility of us mere mortals. So in this discussion, we're going to be focusing on the second premise, the one that says that we can't be morally responsible for anything we say or do unless we can, in some important respect, be the cause of ourselves. Since nothing can be the cause of itself, we can't be morally responsible for our actions. So let's look at the second premise more closely. We start off with just a simple fact about human intentional action. I'm here preparing this video because of a set of beliefs and desires that I happen to have. If those beliefs and desires had been different, then I would be doing something else at this moment. Maybe I'd be writing poetry or working out at the gym. Instead, I'm recording this video. This tells you something about what type of person I am, about what I value. We are known by our deeds. So in order for me to be morally responsible for what I'm doing right now, in order for it to be the case that I deserve credit for what I'm doing, or blame for doing it poorly, it must be the case that I deserve either blame or credit for the beliefs and desires motivating my action. If instead somebody else caused those beliefs and desires to appear in my head, say by pressing a button that activates a brain implant, then it would not make sense to say that I am deserving credit or blame for creating this video. Here is where the need to be the cause of oneself comes in. Unless I can be the cause of my beliefs and desires, I can't be responsible for what those beliefs and desires bring about. Under the assumption that somebody else created those beliefs and desires within me, then they would be responsible for those actions. Only, we would then have to ask whether they could have been the cause of their own beliefs and desires. Perhaps I did choose one of my beliefs or desires. Let's imagine that there was a time when I decided to believe something or decided to want something. That decision to have a belief or a desire would itself have been an action. The decision would have been based on the type of person that I was at the time that I made that decision. This chain keeps going back to when my genes were first interacting with my environment to make me the type of person I have become. Since at no time was I the ultimate reason why I had the beliefs or desires that caused my action, I cannot be responsible for that action. What's responsible for that action? Well, all of the causes and influences that created the beliefs and desires that motivated the action. Okay, so that's Strassen's argument. Now I want to go back. I want to look at the premise that says, in order to be responsible for what you do, you have to be responsible for what you believe or what you desire. I want to look more closely at the phrase, to be responsible. 
In looking at the meaning of the phrase, to be responsible, Galen Strawson explains his answer by referencing what he calls an old story. Here's what he writes, quote, An old story is very helpful in clarifying this question. This is the story of heaven and hell. As I understand it, true moral responsibility is responsibility of such a kind that, if we have it, then it makes sense at least to suppose that it could be just to punish some of us with eternal torment in hell and reward others with eternal bliss in heaven. End quote. This type of responsibility, according to Strassen, requires that we be responsible for being the type of person that deserves this eternal reward or punishment. But according to Strassen, this isn't the case. Strassen says, quote, We are what we are, and we cannot be thought to have made ourselves in such a way that we can be held to be morally responsible for our actions in such a way that any punishment or reward for our actions is ultimately just or fair, end quote. In saying that moral responsibility requires that we be the cause of ourselves, one is saying that it's only legitimate to punish or reward a person who is the cause of themselves. And since no person can be the cause of themselves, no person can justifiably be rewarded or punished. One point that I want to make is that the question of how to justify divine rewards and punishments isn't our problem here. We're concerned with what justifies the reward and punishment of one human being by another human being. Divine rewards and punishments might well require this type of self-causation, but our concern is whether human rewards and punishments have the same requirements. To address this question of whether human rewards and penalties require self-causation, I want to look at an analogy that John Rawls mentions in an article called Two Concepts of Rules. Rawls looks at another set of activities other than morality where people make rules and assign rewards and penalties. This is a feature in many games. Soccer, for example, has rewards and penalties. For example, if a player spits on another player, the offending player can be removed from the game for a period of time. Must we say of soccer penalties that they can't be justly imposed on a player? unless that player has a special kind of self-causation? The point is to draw an analogy between calling a sports penalty because one player spits on another and imposing a penalty on somebody who runs a red light or takes property without consent. The analogy is this. Clearly, the fact that we are not the cause of ourselves doesn't imply that we must abandon the rule-governed practice of sports and games that include rewards and penalties. If rule-governed practices such as soccer can survive this discovery that we are not the cause of ourselves, then why not the rule-governed practices of keeping promises or of property ownership? The practices are quite similar. For example, in games, as in morality, people are rewarded or punished for what they did. Spitting on a player is punished or running a red light. Sports penalties, like moral penalties, are awarded for intentional actions. Accidentally or unavoidably striking another player doesn't result in a penalty. The mere fact that spit traveled from one player and struck another is not grounds for a penalty. The referee's judgment includes a judgment that the player had the requisite mens rea or guilty mind in judging that the rule had been violated. We use the language of responsibility when we discuss sports penalties. A player is deemed responsible for the infraction. A player is responsible for a flag on the field. Along these same lines, players are also considered responsible in the sense of being praised and celebrated for the successful scoring of points or obtaining victories. Yet the assertion that sports players are not the cause of themselves, in Strassen's sense, is not thought to require that we abandon sports with their embedded rewards and penalties. By analogy, the fact that we are not the cause of ourselves doesn't pose a threat to the imposition of moral rewards and penalties. Elon Strassen may object to the sports analogy by asserting that sports responsibility 
isn't what he would call real responsibility. It's not the type of responsibility that he's writing about. Therefore, my use of this analogy involves ultimately changing the subject. For example, Strawson says, quote, compatibilist responsibility famously fails to amount to any sort of true moral responsibility, given the natural strong understanding of the notion of true moral responsibility, characterized above by reference to the story of heaven and hell, end quote. But Strawson's reliance on the term true moral responsibility suggests the possibility that Galen Strawson is committing his own fallacy. It's a type of fallacy that philosophers call a no-true-Scotsman fallacy. The fallacy is illustrated by the following exchange. The first speaker makes an assertion that something is true of a particular type of thing. In this case, our speaker is asserting that no Scotsman drinks tea. Then the second speaker points to a counterexample, a Scotsman that drinks tea, whereupon the first speaker stipulates that, well, no true Scotsman drinks tea, and that this alleged counterexample is not a true Scotsman. The first speaker in this case is making their thesis trivially true by asserting that nothing that can be counted as a counterexample is a true member of the set that he's talking about. One can just as easily argue that no cat is orange by asserting that no true cat is orange. Applying this to Galen Strawson's claim works as follows. Strawson asserts that responsibility of a type that justifies rewards and penalties requires this ability for people to be the cause of themselves. Drawing from Rawls's article, one answers that sports includes a type of responsibility that justifies rewards and penalties without this special type of causation, whereupon Strawson responds that no true responsibility can justify rewards and punishments without this special type of causation. But this answer to Galen Strawson doesn't resolve the issue. Now we have to answer the question, which conception of responsibility makes the most sense of what people are saying when they hold other people morally responsible? Is it the type of responsibility that we find in sports? Or is it the type of responsibility that requires Strawson's self-causation? For example, one can answer that sports responsibilities are a special kind of responsibility. It comes from people volunteering to play a game, having a particular set of rules. Morality, on the other hand, is required. However, this difference can be explained away as irrelevant. Games serve the ends of amusement and entertainment. Moral practice serves the ends of, well, in some cases, life and death, or significant benefits and harms. There are reasons to force people in society to play a, what we might call, a moral game that don't justify forcing people to play soccer. Conscripting somebody into a game of soccer would only make sense if the person conscripted has the capacity to understand the rules and conform to those rules. But then again, conscripting people into the game of morality has the same requirements, where those who lack the capacity to play the moral game aren't considered players. Another claim that Strassen makes about his true moral responsibility is that it's strongly suggested by the emotions of guilt and shame. More specifically, he writes, quote, It is true that neither of these two fundamental moral emotions necessarily presupposes a conception of oneself as truly morally responsible for what one has done. But the fact that both are widespread does at least suggest that a conception of moral responsibility similar to our own, is a natural part of the human moral conceptual repertoire, end quote. When Strawson says that a conception of moral responsibility similar to our own is widespread, he means that a conception of moral responsibility requiring this special self-causation is widespread, though this requires that our own conception of moral responsibility actually does require this special type of self-causation. Can we make sense of guilt and shame without Strawson's requirement of self-causation? The first point to make is that the biological components of guilt and shame 
didn't require Strauss' self-causation. Somehow we evolved a capacity to feel guilt and shame. And some animals have this capacity even though they can't make assumptions about self-causation. So let's assume that you find yourself in a community of beings that have this capacity to feel guilt and shame, and that it's possible to attach this sentiment to performing certain types of actions. Anybody who finds themselves in this type of community would see the advantages of attaching guilt and shame to performing acts like breaking a promise, or if they feared that a displeased God could destroy a community if offended, to any act that might offend such a God. They could attach these moral emotions to a failure to help the community to defend itself, or to a failure to contribute to making sure the community has enough food stored to survive the winter. Culturally attaching guilt to performing or not performing acts of a particular type doesn't require that agents have Strassen's special power of self-causation. In fact, quite the opposite is true. It requires the assumption that a culture can create links between guilt and certain types of behavior, and that this, in turn, can make that type of behavior less common. Here it's relevant to note that guilt conceived of in this way as a backward-looking sentiment. People are made to feel guilty for what they did or for what they failed to do. Furthermore, this social process of attaching guilt to certain types of actions would naturally be accompanied by a social debate over what types of actions does it make sense to attach guilt to. For example, it would make no sense to attach guilt to being of a particular height or gender or anything else that guilt itself could not influence. Another thing to consider is that matters of interpretation are to be judged in part on what's called a principle of charity. Where one interpretation has people saying something false and another interpretation has them saying something potentially true and reasonable, unless there's something else arguing against it, we should go with the true and reasonable interpretation. We can take claims of moral responsibility to be claims about an impossible form of self-causation or about attaching external game-like penalties and internal sanctions such as guilt to types of actions that people have reasons to make less common. The principle of charity says that unless reason can be provided to reject it, we really should go with the second option. To recap, Strassen's true moral responsibility may be a problem for divine rewards and punishments. I'll have to leave that question for the theologians. On the other hand, there are reasons to believe that Strassen's true moral responsibility is not a problem for the practice of attaching penalties and rewards to people performing or failing to perform actions of a particular type. It's no more of a problem for morality than it is for soccer nor is it a problem for the practice of attaching sentiments of guilt or shame to what an agent may do or fail to do, not if it makes these types of actions or inactions less common in situations where an agent can avoid the external sanctions. On this second conception, we can expect societies to have debates over the types of actions or inactions to make the objects of these external and internal sanctions. It makes sense to ask, what types of actions deserve punishment? What types of actions or inactions should a person feel guilty about? Elon Strassen's true moral responsibility, depending as it does on people being the cause of themselves, may well be impossible, but the question still remains whether we are using Strassen's sense of moral responsibility when we impose external and internal sanctions for wrongdoing.